It felt like somebody had taken a baseball bat to my shoulder. I turn and come because the gun goes off. It's supposed to be a cold gun. There was an incredibly loud bang. I just keep insisting, you don't understand because this is not possible. It's just not possible that there's a live round. It's not, it just can't. Two people were shot on Alec Baldwin's movie set. One of them is dead. So how did the live rounds get on the set? Plus, Tupac Shakur murdered 27 years ago. This morning, a music producer and friend of his is joining us live on the show. And search teams recover the body of 13-year-old Madeline Soto. What evidence might her autopsy reveal? It's all coming up next for you, plus much more right here on Opening Statements. Good Monday morning to you and welcome to Opening Statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant, and it's great to have you along with us. Just like in an actual trial here on this show, we get you all ready for what's ahead in court. I like to say the show is kind of like coffee in court. We get you all warmed up every weekday morning. So right now, it's time for you to grab that cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. Something stinks to high heaven in the Rust movie case. I think it's the smell of smoke due to pants on fire. The police and the prosecutors are proceeding on the legal theory that Hannah Gutierrez handed the gun to the assistant director David Halls and Halls handed it to Alec Baldwin. Both Alec Baldwin and Hannah Gutierrez told detectives that same story in their interviews. But then David Halls, who got a plea deal with probation and is cooperating as a state witness as part of that plea deal, took the stand and said something very different. Halls said that Gutierrez handed the gun directly to Alec Baldwin. This means we have a pants on fire situation somewhere. So whose pants are on fire? Are David Halls pants on fire? Or are two sets of pants on fire, pants belonging to Alec Baldwin and Hannah Gutierrez? You see, their statements corroborate each other's. Halls is the only one saying something different. And then there is Sarah Zachary, the prop master who was assisting with some armorer duties. It is very clear that this woman had no clue how to properly handle and load weapons. Yet, she was. What's more, right after Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza were shot, Sarah Zachary goes and tampers with the evidence. She admittedly threw away rounds of ammunition, but she wasn't charged. Why not? Also, she immediately calls up the man who supplied the ammunition, Seth Kenny. And by the way, that guy's gonna be on the stand today. I wonder why that phone call to him was so urgent and pressing right after two people were shot. Something really stinks with this case. Seems to me that the state is relentlessly going after Hannah Gutierrez when there are other people who could be criminally charged and or more harshly punished. And I have a feeling things will be very tense today when Seth Kenny, the ammunition supplier, takes the stand. The defense is contending that he is the person responsible for those live rounds making it onto that movie set. If I'm the defense team, I would light him up like a firecracker on cross. And I have no doubt Hannah Gutierrez's his attorneys will do that. And I'll say this in close, as a former prosecutor, I would want the question of who brought the live rounds to the set definitively answered before taking anybody to trial. That's my opening statement on this Monday morning. Let me know if you like it. Right now, I wanna give you what's on your daily docket. I asked what happened and somebody said, um, <clears throat> Helena was shot or the gun went off, something, something to that effect. And I looked down at Helena who had been sitting at that point um, to my right and, and Joel was on the left. Um, um, in, in obvious pain. 
All right, friends, here's a look at some of the cases we're following for you today on Court TV. In New Mexico, the one I was just talking about, testimony resumes at 10.30 a.m. This is the case against the Rust movie armorer. In Tennessee, jury selection begins at 10 a.m. this morning in a brand new trial against Robin Howington. She's the mother charged in the fatal shooting of her five-year-old daughter. And in Massachusetts, defendant Brian Walsh due in court at 2 p.m. for a status conference in the case of the murder and dismemberment of his wife. Right now, let's get you more on the Baldwin movie set shooting case and go to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we find Court TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft with the latest. Good morning, Julie. Court will be resuming shortly here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the state is expected to rest its case in chief this week. Last week on the stand, we heard from director Joel Souza, who talked about the moments he was shot, how it felt like he was hit by a baseball bat, and that he could not believe live ammunition was on the set. No, I mean, I knew something got me, but the, they kept saying, they kept talking about this bullet, and I... It just it, it could not compute for me. I just kept saying, you don't understand. No, 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 this was a movie set. You don't, that's not possible. You don't get it. And they kept saying, no, 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 it is. And I just keep insisting, you don't understand because this is not possible. It's just not possible that there's a live round. It's not, it just can't. And we also heard from the medic on the movie set of Rust who talked about her thoughts about how Hannah Gutierrez, the defendant in this case, handled her role as the armorer. I would notice our armorer um, hand the guns over to the actors, sometimes checking them, sometimes not. Um, it, generally, once the scene is over, you would remove the weapon. Um, the armorer would remove the weapon from the actor and re-secure it until it is needed again. Uh, on Rust, that did not happen um, a good majority of the time. The actor still remained uh, in possession of the weapon, whether it was in their holster or in their hands. And still on the witness list, Julie, one of the suppliers of the ammunition on the movie set of Rust, Seth Kenny. That's the latest from here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We'll send it back to you. Yes, Seth Kenny, that is going to be huge. Our thanks to Kelly Kraft for that early update. And as Kelly mentioned, one of Friday's key witnesses was surviving victim Joel Souza. If you missed it, he took the stand, detailed what led up to him being shot and his disbelief that it could have been a live round. There was an incredibly loud bang that was not like the half and quarter loads you hear on a set. The, those are sort of, they're loud poofs and pops. This was deafening. And uh, I, um, it felt like somebody had taken a baseball bat to my shoulder. Did you have an understanding that you had been actually shot by a bullet? No, no, I mean, I knew something got me, but the, they kept saying, they kept talking about this bullet and I, it just, it, it could not compute for me. I just kept saying, you don't understand. No, 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 this was a movie set, you know, that's not possible. But it happened, live rounds got on that set and we still don't know who brought them there. Let's talk some more about this. Let me bring in my guests in the studio with me, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Noah Pines, and standing by remotely law enforcement expert Sonny Slaughter. Good morning to you both. Noah, you just heard me talking about how when it comes time for the cross today of Mr. Ammunition Supplier Seth Kenny, this is going to be a big moment for the defense. Um, talk to me how this might be executed, the big points you think they ought to make, please. Well, clearly they want to find out what ammunition was provided. Was a live round provided to Hannah Gutierrez, who, by the way, best transformation I have ever seen for a trial. Whoever changed her look and softened her up, great job. Mm -hmm. she, she's it's perfect. Yes. Um, but I would also, if I was Al Baldwin's lawyer, I'd be watching that testimony, no, 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 this can't happen on a movie set, is really the best evidence for Alec Baldwin to, you know, in his future trial to say, this should never happen. Of course he didn't know. It, it doesn't happen. 
Right. No, Noah, thank you. Good points there. Um, let's look at a clip. And Sonny, I'd like to come to you on the other side of this, please. This is from that Sarah Zachary, the prop master, who uh, I was ripping a bit in my opening statement. This lady who clearly doesn't know how to handle firearms took the stand and, and then she calls up Seth Kenny. See, all, everybody knew each other. They're all friends. They're all working in the industry. And after Joel Souza and Helena Hutchins are shot, Sarah Zachary calls up Seth Kenny. And then she starts dumping rounds into the garbage. Let's watch. Previously, before that, instead of emergency? After the incident, yes. And then you, you all talked. Do you recall anything from that phone call? Again, not telling us what Mr. Kenny said, but do you recall anything from that phone call? Yes. What do you recall? Just him mortified. Oh boy. Okay, Sonny, uh, let me get your thoughts, please, on this lady who's handling guns, uh, isn't charged after she admittedly tampers with evidence, and the state makes her a witness. Your thoughts, please. I'm concerned about that. I believe that everyone should have been thoroughly investigated, charged. This is, um, she's tampering with evidence. Clearly, she sees that something is wrong. So why hasn't she been charged? What makes her a better witness than what everyone else has seen? I'm not sure why they did this, this entire set and the recklessness and the careless behavior of others and the cover up that started from the very onset is concerning and it should concern all of us. I know they have to make the case, give someone the opportunity to, you know, support their evidence, but if they have the evidence, they should not make all of these deals. Right, right, Sonny, I'm with you. Uh, I liked how our friend Dutch Merrick put it. Uh, he's an expert. Uh, on movie sets, he's a firearms expert, an armor, a prop master, well-known guy in Hollywood, and he called it a cascade of failures. That's what we saw on the Rust set. I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, to your point, Sonny, about that, I've got a clip from the medic, uh, Sherilyn Schaefer, the medic who talks about uh, how she saw the casual attitude going on with Hannah Gutierrez in the handling of the guns. A lot of times um, when I would notice, I would notice our armorer um, hand the guns over to the actors, sometimes checking them, sometimes not. Um, it, generally, once the scene is over, you would remove the weapon. Um, the armorer would remove the weapon from the actor and re-secure it until it is needed again. Uh, on Rust, that did not happen um, a good majority of the time. The actor still remained. Uh, in possession of the weapon, whether it was in their holster or in their hands. Mm. So, no, as you know, we haven't heard a lot of great things about Hannah Gutierrez and the way in which uh, she took her job duties. Um, it seems that she had kind of a casual attitude. It seems that there were times where she left firearms unattended, uh, things like that. Um, talk to me about the defense case. How do you view it here? You know, as somebody who's been a prosecutor, now you do defense work in the private sector. Do you think they have a shot here at prevailing in this case? Bad pun, right? Uh, I, not with Hannah. I mean, it's ultimately her responsibility. She, regardless of people supervising her, her job is to make sure that that gun is safe to be used on a movie, and if she didn't do it, then she's criminally negligent, which is what she's charged with. Right, appreciate it, Noah. Noah Pine, Sunny Slaughter, I'm so glad you both are here. Stand by, please. Gotta hit a break. Here's what we have, though, coming up next. Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26th near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body. The remains of 13-year-old Madeline Soto found and her mother's boyfriend is in custody. We're wondering this morning, what might her autopsy reveal? And Tupac Shakur's music producer is joining us live on the show this morning to talk about Tupac's tragic murder and what justice should look like. I'm the armor, or at least I was. A 
famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and come, the gun, the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Now for what's trending in true crime, the body of a missing Florida teenager has been located and police are pointing to her mother's boyfriend as the main suspect. 13-year-old Madeline Soto was last seen alive in late February as she was preparing for just another day of school, but she never made it to class. Police have arrested her mother's boyfriend, 37-year-old Stephen Stearns, on charges of sexual battery and possession of sexual abuse material. Now, Stern was the last person to see Madeline on February 26 when he was supposed to be dropping her off at her school. Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26 near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body in the early morning hours on that day. Detectives later recovered Madeline's backpack and her school-issued laptop from that dumpster. At 819, we have evidence that shows Stephen Stearns returning to the complex and Madeline was visible in that vehicle we believe she was already dead at that time. This is so disgusting, isn't it? Police claim to have some very disturbing images on Stern's cell phone, as well as that key surveillance video. So our question this morning, what do you think the autopsy will reveal about the case? Let's bring in our guest in the studio with me, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Noah Pines, and standing by remotely, law enforcement expert Sonny Slaughter and retired criminal defense attorney Kirk Nurmi. Uh, big welcome to you all on this. Uh, Kirk, let me start with you, uh, please. Uh, your thoughts on this case, the thoughts on Stephen Stearns, the charges he's currently facing, and what you think we may glean from the autopsy. Well, oh. Starting with the autopsy, Julie, I think it's going to ultimately tell a tragic tale, right? It's going to tell us the manner of death. It might give us an approximation of time. And sadly, the reality is it's going to give us an insight into what Madeline endured prior to her death. I mean, the images that you referenced uh, on, on his phone, what have you, those are the charges he's currently being held on now in terms of also in terms of moving the body. I think that's going to help paint a pretty clear picture, a tragic picture of what went on here, a disgusting picture, as you mentioned. And ultimately, it's going to be, and, and that phone data as well, what was he, you know, where was he, what have you. So I think we're going to get a pretty clear picture here that common sense is probably leading us to conclusions uh, that we have right now. I think that's going to be supported by the autopsy. Right, Kirk. I I'm thinking uh, that beautiful child may have been sexually abused, uh, child sex abuse material on his phone, according to police. He was the last one in contact with her. Uh, I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but that seems to be where um, police are hinting with what they've revealed so far. Uh, Sunny, to you next, please. Your thoughts. If um, the police are saying child sexual abuse material and it includes Madeline, then I'm also going to ask the question, what happened to trigger the actual murder? Uh, how long has he been the mom's boyfriend? How long has the sexual abuse been going on? And I'm also going to be looking at the autopsy to see if the trigger could have been that Madeline if he was sexually abusing her, was potentially pregnant, and that's what set off this um, criminal activity of alleged murder by him. I'm also going to be wondering if he's ever done this before. And uh, it may have been that they have found a lot of stuff on his phone that sends him down the rabbit hole to other victims that we don't know about. This is horrific. Um, I'm not going to blame Madeline's mother at the moment. We don't have enough evidence for that to determine whether she was uh, complicit. But I am going to say that this is horrible and we have got to stop these type of criminals. They don't have a look, so we should not be looking for a certain look and a type of person. 
They're predators by nature, and this is what they do. I appreciate everything you just said, Sonny. Thank you for all of that. You mentioned the collection of evidence. What else there may be? I've got a clip from the press conference, uh, and I'd like to come to you on the other side of it, Noah. We have video evidence that shows Stephen Stearns discarding items in a dumpster in that apartment complex in Kissimmee at 735 on Monday, February 26. Detectives later recovered Madeline's backpack and her school issued laptop from that dumpster. Mm, the backpack, the laptop, the dumpster. Uh, Noah, your thoughts on all of this, please. Well, clearly he's trying to hide all the evidence, which he's not very good at because he got caught on video because there's videos all over the place these days. Um, so it's not looking very good for whatever timeline he created, you know, knowing that she was last with him and then he's dumping some of her stuff. Right. Um, this guy's, uh, he's in trouble. He's in big trouble. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, there's, you know, when you think of an autopsy, it's probably strangulation or blunt force trauma and something like this, which would indicate that she was resisting and he then killed her. It, it, it certainly uh, sounds uh, that way. I, I want to know more about this guy. I want to know, uh, like Sonny said, does he have a history? Is there any past criminal history? Any uh, thing that would show he's got a proclivity toward children? Uh, this is just uh, disgusting stuff. Our heart goes out to uh, to Madeline Soto's loved ones as they grieve her. Uh, and there's another family grieving, as you all know, the family of Lake and Riley. Let's talk about this case. The University of Georgia's campus still reeling. Of course they are. After her brutal murder, she was laid to rest on Friday. The suspect in her case is Jose Ibarra. He's also here illegally from Venezuela, uh, and uh, he's got an ICE detainer on him, so he's not going anywhere. He's facing numerous charges, including malice murder and felony murder in the 22-year-old's death. Now, the day before Riley's funeral, the Georgia legislature passed a bill that empowers police to arrest anyone suspected of entering the country illegally. And this measure would require police to report to the feds when someone is in custody and is here illegally. Now, our question this morning, will we see justice for Lake and Riley? If so, what might that look like? Uh, Noah, I'd like to start with you uh, being licensed to practice in the state of Georgia. I, I know you're aware there's been a special prosecutor assigned to this case. Uh, tapping into your experience as a prosecutor, how do you think this case may play out? Well, if anyone's going to get justice for her, it is the special prosecutor, Sheila Ross. She is top-notch, um, one of the best prosecutors probably in the country. She's handled big time high profile cases in the state of Georgia when she was in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office and now she's part of PAC, which is a statewide agency. She is somebody I respect tremendously and she will do everything she can to get that family justice. She will, she is thorough, like really, really thorough, Julie. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. She sounds like quite an accomplished woman. I know you would know uh, of her, her reputation, all of that. And uh, so the case is in good hands, without a doubt. And I think one of the big questions is whether capital punishment will be pursued. Uh, let me turn to our other guest now. Uh, Sonny, I'd like to go to you on this point, please. Do you think we will see uh, the state pursue the death penalty on this one? Absolutely. Georgia does it, um, you know, like New York, they're one of the best at getting things done. I concur with Attorney Pines. Sheila Ross is a stellar um, uh, special prosecutor, prosecutor and attorney. So I do believe that they will pursue the death penalty. This was so heinous in nature and so unexpected. I cannot imagine that Georgia will ever let him go for any reason. So I think we're going to see this case wrapped up. The family will get justice and we will need to come up with other measures on how to address, you know, how he got in contact with her. Was he pursuing her at some other point in time and she just did not know or was this a crime of opportunity? Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, Sonny. Uh, Kirk, to you next, please. And, uh, and you have the unique experience of doing capital cases, and you, of course, do not believe in the death penalty. You and I have had spirited you know, debates uh, on the show, and I, you know, I respect you tremendously. I always say you saved Jody Arias' life, one of the most famous cases of our time. She's alive today because of your great advocacy work. Um, so taking the other side for us, just for the sake of our, our dialogue here with Jose Ibarra, um, what are the reasons uh, not to pursue the death penalty for him, Kirk? 
Well, you know, that that's a such a broad question, right? Obviously, I, as you said, Julie, you know, I, I'm against the death penalty. I respect your position as well. But, you know, one of the things that if the death penalty is being pursued, somebody is doing as a death penalty lawyer is collecting as much information on the client as possible. They want to know their background. They're wanting to gonna know, want to know everything. Get a psychological evaluation because, you know, Julie, there's two ways to save a capital defendant's life in a, in a death penalty. One is at the trial level and the other is at the appellate level. So you're going to want to start building that case, making those motions that might result in the any sentence that is imposed, any death sentence that is imposed being overturned 10 or 15 years down the road. So those are the things that you're looking at, collecting all that mitigation information. You're looking at challenging the evidence. You know, you're going to have two attorneys, you're going to build a team, and you're going to be going at it right away no holds barred, everything you can to save that person's life because that's your charge as a capital defense attorney. Whether you like that person or sure. not, or whether you believe they're innocent or not, that's your job. Right. Ooh, so well said, uh, Kirk. And this is important to understand. I, I always say, you know, uh, defense attorneys have such a tough job, an important job that our Constitution requires. I always say, don't get mad at the defense attorneys. If you want to get mad at their client, go ahead, but don't get mad at them. Uh, they have they have a, a very tough job, and it's a noble one. We've got to leave it there for now, but great discussion as always. Kirk Nermy, we've got to say goodbye, and thank you to you. We'll see you soon. Sonny and Noah are going to stay with us. want you to do the same. We've got a great interview review coming up next. Tupac Shakur is a music legend and for a long time this community and worldwide have been wanting justice for Tupac. Today we are taking that first step. Tupac's music producer DJ Daryl Anderson is joining us next live here on opening statements to talk about his friend and colleague, and what justice looks like for Tupac. And there have been conflicting stories on who handed Alec Baldwin the deadly gun. Was it armor Hannah Gutierrez, or was it assistant director David Halls? This morning, we're spotlighting the murder of iconic rapper Tupac Shakur as we're looking ahead to the trial of Dwayne Keefe D. Davis. And we here on opening statements, as you know, always like to put the focus on the victim. So this morning, we're talking about the late, great rapper with one of his friends and music colleagues. Here with us, the producer and co-writer of Keep Your Head Up, Platinum producer DJ Daryl. Daryl, good morning to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. So could you just take us back? Let, let's go back together to how you connected with Tupac and how you two started working together. Well, you know, Tupac was with uh, Digital Underground uh, and the studio that, that Digital Underground used to record in, my group four and five used to record in as well so we kind of ran into each other you know as they're leaving we're coming and vice versa so uh, one session as we were wrapping our session up playing music from that day he's coming in with digital underground and he heard some of my production and he fell in love with it and he was like hey you know I, when I get my deal man I want I want you to produce my record you know and he, you know, he always kind of stood out. He had that energy where everybody was just kind of nonchalant. He was always excited and, and had no problem with letting, you, letting me know how great, how much he loved my production. So when he got it, his situation all together with his, rec, with his record deal, we, we locked in at, his, uh, at a studio that he put together in his apartment and did all the pre-production there. And we went to the studio and started working and, Keep Your Head Up was one of the ones that um, we knew from, from the moment we finished it that it was going to be the one. So you knew it was going to be a hit? Oh, yeah. Everybody in the studio heard it, and they was like, oh, yeah, this is it. This is, this is the one right here, without a doubt. So and it was his first platinum have, hit, uh, right? It was his first record, his platinum record, and my first platinum record. That's so awesome. it, it, it holds a special place in my heart, you know, especially with all the stuff that surrounded him you know with his career that song always seemed to be the one that people remember him from isn't that the along truth with his acting 
Isn't yeah, that the truth, so it's, and it's still relevant to this day. Yeah, right. it's a big deal for me too. What was the writing yes. process like with him? Well, with him, this was his uh, second album. So his first album, his his big hit was uh, Brenda's Got a Baby, and. I think he wanted to. He wanted. He he knew all the all the mistakes he made from that album to take to to not do on the second album. So we pre-producted everything, and he he would sit around. We would have these conversations about what would make people what would make people a million people go and buy your album. And he said, you know, you make something about um, women being uplifted and and motivating people. So. The process and writing that he had an idea of what what samples he wanted to use and he was like I just we need the right singing and and we, we, that was really the process we, once we put it all together you know he knew that I could do it and I knew that he was his the lyrics was going to land on the music properly so it just kind of came together you know the other songs were more party songs and, and they really wasn't. Um, they didn't stand out like Keep Your Head Up did. So he was real passionate about that. You know, he was able to put some of his poor, his poetry writing skills to that song. So it really, the process was a little different from how he he started writing when he got over to Death Row. So you did a brilliant there, he was job. just knocking songs out back to back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it was, it was, it, it flowed. I just, I could say it flowed. It was a, a, a easy, comfortable, process you know mm -hmm. even though he was rushing everything he was always rushing but it still was an easy comfortable process and what was so he, he like daryl you know the tupac you got to see behind the scenes not in the public eye was he the same person um when i first met tupac and and he started hanging out with with uh, me and a few of my other friends he was always excited you know he was always um, full of energy and just always ready to go, you know. Um, I think after, oh, I, we, once he did, once he did um, the movie Juice, things started getting a little different because he he wasn't he hadn't got used to the fame, you know. When we went to the mall one time and the well, the store we was in, it was just it started crowding up, and this was after the movie Juice, and then we kind of could see that he we all could look and tell. When I say all of us, all of the people that was that was with us that day, we could all tell that he was headed in a different direction, and he he would have to move different. So his energy kind of shifted a little bit, you know. But he was always animated, excited, happy, smiling, and you know, just full of life. Sure, full of life. You know, he was he was just a really cool person to be around. Daryl, were you ever worried about his safety back when you were working with him when he was alive? Um, not him, because see, <laughs> he wasn't the star that everybody know right now. You know, he was just one of the homeboys when, when we first started. And uh, actually was another artist that we was, we were all, that, that used to be my rapper. He was a bigger star than Tupac, but like I said, after that juice, movie came out, things changed. And, and one time we got into an incident, but it wasn't about him. It was about all of us. But so I wasn't really worried about his safety, even though a lot of times people would um, would test him because they he did such a good job in Juice. People thought that that's who he was. But that's well, the person, the character that he played in Juice is not who he was in real life. He was He was just a real, caring person you know he's the kind of person that if he saw you on the side of the road and you were on you was on flat he would pull over and help he was that kind of person you know? that's awesome you know and i know it, it was easy to form a friendship with him and his death has been something that has been extremely upsetting to you for for many years you've been longing for justice for him and now finally the time may have come with the, an arrest in his murder case with Dwayne Keefe D. Davis. And so, Daryl, I'd like to talk to you a bit about what justice may look like. And I, I want to start with this confession that was audio recorded, done by Detective Greg Kading, who I know that you are familiar with, the guy who arguably uh, worked this case uh, 
to the point that he is the authority on it, really knows more than anybody about the backstory and all of that. And here, uh, what we're going to hear is Greg Kading talking with Keefe D and Keefe D talking about how Tupac's shooting occurred. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so again, uh, this today's report that's going to get generated is specifically on Tupac Las Vegas incident. And uh, we'll get you a copy of that report and have you make sure everything's solid before it's, it's you know. Completed. All right. Man, well, I feel I'll still go to jail with that, good. Because this is federal. And that's what, what they said. What is said right here cannot be used against you, TV. Okay, and in that video, that was just a brief clip of it, but we know he, he confesses, he talks about passing the gun in the back seat uh, where his nephew Orlando Anderson was sitting. Orlando, of course, beat up in that fight that was caught on camera. We see Tupac and Suge Knight uh, with the beating. Um, everybody in that car is dead except for Keefe D. Um, Daryl, right. what are you looking for with the upcoming trial set for November? What are you hoping to see in the way of justice for your friend? Well, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, everybody that was involved won't get, you know, won't get put in the, in the position that QPD is in to be, you know, for the people to see the faces and how, you know, these people gunned him down it, it, it's, um, but I, I will say this, this is the, the, the thing about it. Everybody already kind of knew who was involved. So I think it, right now it's just a good time for those people are now that what that person is now being punished for it because of the streets, you know, the streets of California, they already knew who was all, who, who were the people that was involved with the shoot. I mean, even some of the officers knew who was involved, but I guess they had to get all the, the right evidence. So just to know that there is a trial taking place, you know, for the murder of Tupac is, uh, is enough justice for me to see that it's something finally being done about it, you know, because for years, you know, you would always hear, you know, these people are responsible for Tupac's death. These are the people that actually did it, you know, and like I said, a, a lot of people already knew that. But now we finally got somebody to hold accountable for it. So that's that's just within itself for me. I appreciate it, Daryl. Accountability, uh, really, really key here. Uh, and we appreciate you. You are a yeah. very busy guy. You're very well known in the music industry. You've collaborated with all of the, the best names in music. I mean, Snoop Dogg, Keisha Cole, Rick Ross, Kendrick Lamar. I mean, everybody knows you. Uh, and everybody doesn't know something special you were working on. Uh, I, I know you can't share a lot here, but it has to do with Tupac, right? You've got a project coming up. Give us a little bit, if you would, please, DJ Daryl. Well, it's, it's, so, you know, me and Tupac, we recorded, uh, when we, when Keep Your Head Up is the song that everybody knows. So it was an actual whole album that we recorded. But um, we were not able to release all of the songs because of, uh, controversy behind, you know, his first album, there was a state trooper that was shot and killed from some guy who listened to a Tupac song. He said it inspired him, inspired him to, 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 you know, shoot. So a lot of the songs that we did, that we pr produced when we did Keep Your Head Up had a lot of those type of songs where it was just, you know, a lot of police brutality, retaliation, if you will, you know, because you know he had a situation in Oakland where he was beat up by the police, so he was a little angry uh, with the police. So anyway, those songs never, never were released, and so we still, I still have some of those songs, and um, I put a lot of new production to them, and and um, I don't, I'm still working out all the, you know, the the intricate parts of the music business. I'm still working that out with it, so it's it's all in the works right now. It's coming this together, though. But I mean, I, the music, I'm just trying to work out all the legal parts of it now. Right. So so this would be a posthumous album uh, yes. of Tupac yes. Shakur that, that you would be releasing. That. Wow. Right. Oh, right. my gosh. It's, so it's, never it's, um, before heard songs that you've got in your music yeah, it, arsenal. The album was called Troublesome 21. Troublesome 21. That's when he was 21, 21 years old at the time. So. 
Wow. Yes. And actually the, the cover for his second album, Strictly, um, was the cover for Troublesome 21. So, so they they kind of just put it to the side and said, we'll, we'll come back to those. Wow. This is really, really exciting stuff you're sharing with us, Daryl. Uh, please keep us posted. Uh, everybody who was a Tupac fan uh, could use a new Tupac album. I had to dust off my old CD of his greatest hits. And in the liner notes, I see DJ Daryl Anderson uh, as producer and co-writer for Keep Your Head Up. Thank you yeah. so much yeah. for your time this morning. Thank you. Of course, and we'd love to talk yes. to you more as the trial rolls around. November the 4th is when Dwayne Keefe D. Davis goes to trial. DJ Daryl Anderson, thank you so much. We're going to hit a break, folks. When we come back, we're breaking down the facts surrounding the deadly prop gun incident on the Rust movie set. Don't go away. A famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and hop the gun, the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Now for what's tipping the scales, testimony set to resume in the involuntary manslaughter case against the Rust movie armor, Hannah Gutierrez. And a key witness from last week, David Halls, the assistant director on the movie. There's some disagreement, though, over the final exchange of the gun before the shooting of Helena Hutchins. Halls says that Hannah Gutierrez gave the gun directly to Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin said the same. Take a listen to what Hannah Gutierrez says, though. Or, I'm sorry, Alec Baldwin didn't say the same. He didn't say that. He says what Hannah says, and you're going to see it right here. Take a look. Well, I walked in there, and I handed the gun to Alex a couple of times, and Alex took it, and everyone was there with him. Alex? Alex. Okay. Baldwin, yeah. At one point, Dave had it, uh, the assistant director, but he was just sitting in with it, and then I saw him, and I was like, okay. This is fine, he's just sitting in, and then I walked out, and yeah. And how do you know that Dave had it? I handed it off to Dave while he was sitting in for the shot. Okay, so she's saying she handed it to Dave Halls. Alec Baldwin says the same thing happened. Hannah handed it to Dave Halls, who in turn handed it to him. But Dave Halls gets up there and says the opposite. He says that there was a direct handoff between Gutierrez and Alec Baldwin. Someone's pants are on fire. Let's talk about it. I'm going to bring in my guest, attorney Noah Pines, former prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Um, what do you make of this? That's a pretty big uh, thing uh, to be uh, having contradictory testimony on. Jeez. Is, is it a big thing? It doesn't matter who handed him the gun? I don't think it does. If I, I mean, people obviously misremember stuff all the time. Um, especially when you're on a movie set, lots of things are going on. I, I don't know if any of this is captured on film or not. Maybe it is. But who handed the gun doesn't really matter. It's who loaded the gun. Well, okay, but if it's in someone's hands, right, there could be loading. If she's walking away and Halls has it in his hands, right? And he's loading it. But, I mean, if the testimony is she's, who's responsible for getting those blanks or whatever is right. in the gun and making sure it's safe? That's really what this case is about. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand what her defense is. If it's her responsibility, to, unless she's going to say, after I safely loaded the gun, someone unloaded it and reloaded it with different right. ammunition, that would be the only way that I think she gets out of responsibility. Yeah. I wonder if that's where they may go, Noah, if, especially in light of what he said, if he's, you know, um, trying to say he never touched the gun why is he trying to say that uh, it, it just seems like yeah. such a, a memorable thing like you would remember who gave you the gun I, it, it just i don't know um something something stinks with it um so what do you think i guess what what is her best defense now that we're talking along those lines oh we're gonna have to leave it there we're almost out of time you Noah. um you think if someone else loaded it like an intervening cause basically yeah. is that what you're saying if there's an intervening someone you know if she had the gun and then someone else loaded it 
that yeah. would absolve her of responsibility potentially, but otherwise right. it's her responsibility. She's in trouble. She's Noah in charge. Pines. Oh, I wish we had more time. Thank you so much. That is all for this episode of Opening Statements. Court TV Live is up next. I'm coming along with you. We're going to go over the big testimony from the Baldwin shooting cases. We get ready for today to begin.